We're joined by Boyd Vardy. Uh, Boyd was raised in Londolozi Game Reserve in South Africa. Um, he currently lives and works at the reserve, and his most recent recent project include advocating for restoration of ancient elephant corridor, helping the Good Work Foundation create more learning centers in South Africa. He wrote a book called Cathedral of the Wild about his experiences at Londolozi. Um, Londolozi has been in his family for what, four generations now, okay. um, and he's going to join us here to share his experiences. So let's give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. So, much. so can. Starting off, can you talk about um, Londolozi? Sure. So Londolozi, um, the story of Londolozi begins like a lot of good stories with the intake of large quantities of gin. <laughs> and it begins in 1926 with my great-grandfather at a tennis party in Johannesburg. And he heard about these bankrupt cattle farms that lay adjacent to the Kruger National Park in the wild eastern part of South Africa. and. Uh, they had come up for sale because they were bankrupt, and they were bankrupt for two reasons. The one was that um, it's a very, it's very rough terrain out there. It's low rainfall. It's, it's a difficult area to operate in. And the other was that lions were eating all of the cattle that roamed there as a cattle ranch. Um, and in 1926, my, my great-grandfather was an adventurer. He was a hunter. And this place that sounded terrible to everyone else sounded like a, a wild place where you could go and have an adventure to him, where you could go and hunt lions, particularly. Hunt lions and hunt, uh, go and hunt animals. And so, sight unseen, after too many gin and tonics, they bought the property. And um, they went down there for the first time in the June of 1926. And it was a, a whole rigmarole to get there. You had to go out to these sort of real um, border towns and they caught a train, and the train ran through the southern part of this property, and they bribed the train driver to stop. And they got off, and they walked on a compass bearing directly north into this wild hinterland. Uh, they didn't know where they were going. Halfway along the way, um, the porters who they had with them said, well, this is madness. We're being led to our death here. And my great-grandfather spoke a bit of Zulu, and he was able to talk them into keep going. And eventually, at, just as night was falling, they, they arrived under this big, beautiful ebony tree on the banks of the river. And, and that's where they sort of set up their first um, hunting camp. And the hunting camp was, and, and the, I should tell you that the story moves away from hunting. Um, and I think the, real, the, the story of this place holds so much of uh, what I think is pertinent today. So, you know, what they did is they went there to hunt and they came down uh, every year in the winter to hunt lions and leopards and there wasn't a lot of game there. The, the property was very run down. It was eye high scrub. And they built these three mud huts. It was very rudimentary. I'm told that uh, people, when it rained, would go and stand outside of the accommodations for shelter because the accommodations were so uh, leaky and, and open. Um, but for three generations, that's what happened. They went there and they would hunt uh, particularly predators. And then uh, in 1969, my grandfather died very suddenly, and my father and my uncle were about 14 and 15 years old. And they were told by all of the family advisors, look, you know, you've lost your father now, you need to look after your mother. And the first thing is you've got to get rid of that wild place where you go and hunt. Hunting's a bad idea to start with, and just you've got to get rid of it. And they said, no, that's, we, we feel compelled towards that place. We feel called to it. And they said, well, how are you going to look after your mother? And as teenage boys, and I think this was probably the beauty and, of, and arrogance of youth, they said, we will make it pay. And that's how my family got into the safari business. These two young boys decided they would make this place viable. And they decided that they would take the entire safari business in one go. They would do canoe safaris, hunting safaris, walking safaris, and they would, you know, it was people would come down and stay in these mud huts. And the first canoe safari, they hit a hippo with their canoe, so they cancelled canoe safaris. The walking safaris were always a bit of a mess, and so it was very, you know, that they had one Land Rover that they would drive around, but it only turned to the left. Um, and and if you went there, the other thing was you you. In a month or two of being there, you might see very sparse game, a few antelope, maybe the occasional lion or leopard, and it was trying to get away from you. And so they, they, would under, they were trying to do this endeavor, but they had no guidance, and it was a pretty ropey operation. And then they had a real defining encounter. 
uh, they met a man by the name of Ken Tinley. And Ken was this fascinating character. He had dropped out of high school, but then been admitted into a biological sciences degree because he drew a picture of a moth with such intricate detail that the dean of the biology faculty said to him, OK, you're in. Uh, and then he had worked as a scientist in the Kruger National Park, uh, where he hadn't been well received because he was a real early believer in the, the idea that all things are connected. And he was sounding off on people's intellectual territory, the expert on lions, the expert on elephants, and he was saying we need to look at it holistically. <coughs> so he wasn't so well received in, in the Kruger, and he went to a reserve in Mozambique for a while, and he lived in solitude for about a year. And during that time, he walked in this wild, vast landscape of this reserve in Mozambique called Gorongosa. And he mapped the topography, drawing by hand. And he developed this incredibly intricate sense of how a landscape fits together and how the topography informs the flow of water and how that informs your soils and how that tells you which fauna and flora you got there. But he saw it very holistically and almost his connection to the wilderness it almost lived inside of him. He felt it very deeply. And then the war broke out in Mozambique, and he ran back to South Africa. And he arrived, uh, he sort of washed up into the camp where I grew up, and he met these two young men, and very soon after, my mother, who had also moved to live there, who were living in these really rudimentary accommodations, and they didn't really know what they were doing. They were trying to start a safari company. They had this vision that they would get people to come on safari, but it wasn't really working. And he said to them, if you want this place to work, and this was really the defining moment, or one of the defining moments, you need to partner with the land. You need to begin to think of the animals as your kin. You need to think of them as a part of an extended family of, of beings. And you need to make sure that the local people participate in the well-being of this place. And they said to him, well, well, restore the land, partner with the land, what do you mean? And he said, come, I'll show you. And he took them out onto this terrain, and where the cattle had grazed the land bare, you got this, you get, what you get is bare ground, and then when the rain falls, you lose all of that moisture. And then as you lose the moisture, you get scrub coming in, and the scrub starts to take over. And he showed them how you could clear the scrub away and plug it into where you were losing the moisture in these deep, erosive furrows. And it's kind of like putting the plug back in a bath. And... As you do this work of clearing the scrub and, and restoring these micro catchments, suddenly the grassland started to come back. And so they started this work of, of restoring the land, and, and suddenly there would be grasslands. And then one day you would come out, and where there had been no animals, suddenly there would be a herd of zebra, and then suddenly a herd of wildebeest. And, and slowly, and then, and then they started to see Inyala, and there was this real sense that as they had this intention to work with the land, the land was starting to respond. Um, and about six or seven years into that process, they had another real defining encounter. And it was late one afternoon. They had been working on the land. They were driving home in this beat-up old Land Rover. And into the late afternoon light, in front of them, in front of their Land Rover, about 200 yards in front of them, a leopard stepped out onto the road. And she was a young female leopard. And instead of running away like every other leopard had, had done ever that they had seen, she stopped in the late afternoon light and she looked at them. She gave this little growl and they saw she had this one broken canine. And they watched her for a moment and it was this real, really strong sense of for a moment they were allowed to see her. She granted them this moment with her and then she stepped off the road and disappeared. And they drove home together in silence and I don't know if you've ever had a sort of a scary encounter in a vehicle where sort of you pull over and then everyone just sits there for a moment in absolute silence. And then my father looked at my uncle and he said, whatever just happened, that's my future. And I think it's such an it's such a amazing thing to have an encounter like that with your destiny in life. Um, and so for the next about 12, 10 and 12 years, he woke up every morning and he teamed up with a local tracker, a Shangan man called Elman Mflongo. And every day they went out and they tracked that leopard. And slowly... Um, sometimes days would go by they didn't see her and then they would see her from a great distance and she would disappear and then they would see her from a great distance and she would allow herself to be seen and over the course of years she she started they started to build the trust where they could get closer and closer and eventually it got to the point where they would sit in a land over here and she would be where you're sitting over there lying close by 
And then one day they were watching her and they knew she had cubs somewhere nearby because they could see that she was lactating. And, but they didn't think the cubs were anywhere close by and a cub came out of the grass and ran up to the mother and jumped onto her head. And, and there was this very strong sense that as they worked on the land, as the land started to recover, this emissary appeared from, from the wild side. This leopard came out to them and slowly allowed herself to be seen. And that leopard became known as the mother leopard because she, was the, she went on to have a number of litter of cubs. And all of those cubs grew up m modeling their mother's trust. Suddenly they knew that the people here meant no harm, so they would allow themselves to be seen. And so in the middle of apartheid South Africa where no one wanted to go, suddenly word started to get out all over the world that there was this place you could go to and see a wild leopard. And that lives in the psyche, uh, of, in the human psyche, the mystery of it, the beauty of it, the pull of being able to have an encounter with that cat. And so she became the mother leopard because she was the mother of these cubs, but also because she gave an incredible amount of momentum to this place where I grew up. Suddenly it became a place where people wanted to come. Suddenly more people started to come. As they started to come, uh, an economy of wildlife started to be established. So in the, we established a little village there. Local people started working in the tourism industry and we became all unified in the protection of this place uh, as a means of, uh, of looking after our own families. And it was, it was like a, this relationship developed. As we cared for this place, it really started caring for us. Um, and so that's, so, you know, I, when I think about uh, what I do, it's really to tell people that I have seen a restoration. I have seen a place where we've gone from being at war with nature to back in relation with it. And I've seen the effects that that can have on the people who live on that land. You know, you start to experience yourself as belonging to a place. And it's this very primary belonging. You know that it's important for you to be here. And your, your value is, is present with you in, in the relationship with the place. You know the animals as a part of you. There's, it's, it's different every day, but there's the sense of kinship. It's a very fundamental um, psychological belonging. And I think that a lot of the anxiety that we see and the depression that we see in modern life is undiagnosed homesickness for belonging to a place, for knowing yourself in relation to other creatures and for feeling yourself as a part of. You know, I, sort of, I always say that um, in a society where the individual self is disconnected from the greater whole, the search for meaning is reduced to how I am doing in comparison. You know, and and that's, that's sort of the opposite of what you experience when you live in wilderness because it's, you know yourself as belonging to all of this and then the meaning starts to change radically. The meaning becomes about us in relation. Sh the meaning becomes about sharing. The meaning becomes about being together, uh, not competing against. And that's a very uh, interesting experience to have in the wild animal of your own body. You know, so um, so that, is, that is what I grew up in and that is what has informed the sort of work that I want to do and the message that I want to spread. Also, um, your, uh, the game preserver is known for the elephants you brought back to the territory. Can you yes. talk about how you guys want to... Yeah. So what happened was is that there was an, a fence that ran between our reserve and the Kruger National Park. And the fence was called a veterinary fence, but it was actually erected by the apartheid government to use the Kruger National Park as a buffer zone between Mozambique and South Africa. So the fence had absolutely no... To put a fence between wildlife and wildlife is madness. And a lot of animals died that would have moved in that area, died against that fence. And... Uh, very early on, we wanted the elephants to return to Londolozi, and so my father and uncle set off to do the first ever live elephant relocation. Uh, and this was in the 70s, and that they actually um, caught elephants in the Kruger National Park and, and moved them in, in trucks back into this area to, to re-establish their presence. But then they, re and, and they, were act they, they were successfully did that, although there were many mishaps along the way. They, they didn't have crates big enough for the elephants. They put an elephant in a, 
in an antelope crate and it breathed in and the crate fell apart. And so there was all sorts of <laughs> shenanigans in trying to move ele elephants to this place. But very quickly we realized that that was not the way to do it. The, the real thing to do was to advocate for the removal of the fence. And, and that is something that after uh, Nelson Mandela came to power in 1994, we were actually able to achieve. And the fence came down. And as the fence came down, it was this incredible thing to go from having these few elephants that had been brought in to watching this natural rhythm of elephants flowing back into the reserve and going from a couple of elephants to, in the winter months, 1,500 elephants uh, coming into the reserve from Kruger National Park, um, walking up the river. I mean, at certain times in the winter, well, our camp is on the river, and you come out, and every day there's elephants down there in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's this feeling that, that they've returned to where they belonged. Um, and so anywhere, that, and, and that's the core of it is to return to this more natural state and live amongst it, you know. Um, yeah, so that's, that's been a huge victory and we need, a part of what I see as this place having been a part of the restoration is that it's not conservation and particularly in these times, it's not standing at the end of any wild places we have left and saying, please can we protect what we have left. It's starting to say, no, if we start to think about restoring, we can actively go and, and reclaim, start to bring nature back to life but it comes out of a psychology of restoration. It comes out of saying, let's reach out, let's restore, let's, let's bring back. And so some of my work is to say it's possible. And, and you know, I hope that a movement of restoration can start to take root all over the world where we start to say, no, let's go actively and, and reconnect with nature and reclaim it. And, and there's sort of two parts to that. And the one is active restoration of wild places. But the other is um, to restore ourselves, to reconnect with a deeper part of ourself. Um, because what I see happening is as I any type of healing that you do from trauma, any type of reconnecting with your being that you do, if you can get under all of the patterns of compensation and neuroses that modern life gives us and touch your own wild being, what happens is this overwhelming feeling of enough. You know, there's this feeling that I am enough. Um, this is enough. There is enough for all of us. Um, and so some of the work that I see has, has to happen out in the active physical space of reclaiming wilderness, and other parts of it has to happen inside of us. Um, and we have, to, we have to discover what needs to be restored in us as a part of the restoration movement because if you can establish, if you can touch that feeling of enough, your whole what drives you in life changes and the desire to consume and have more and, and try and attain more gives way to a whole different way of wanting to be in life, a way that is much more about uh, sharing your essence, feeling fulfilled, being involved in things that are meaningful to you, that you care about. The whole value directive changes when you start to live from that place. So I think that's going to be part of the restoration movement. Excellent. Now, for us who, people who don't spend a lot of time in the bush, and for you, you're able to do boarding school in Johannesburg at some times. Were there practices that you use when you're living in Johannesburg to get yourself back in touch with yourself? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, all of the modalities um, that, are, that we're seeing taking root in the Western world, you know, yoga, meditation, um, breathe, breathe, breath work, that sort of stuff, is, is, is certainly um, door, doorways to it. But I think another dimension is to live on the feeling. So um, it's kind of like your body is a wild animal. Your body knows uh, it, has a, it has a different way of being in the world, you know, and, it, and it's a Mary Oliver says you don't have to be good. You don't have to walk on your knees for a thousand miles through the desert. You just have to let the soft animal of your body want what it wants. So well, what I see, what wildness is, is getting in touch with living on the feeling. Getting in touch with your inner guidance system, your inner tracker, your inner compass, and living on that instead of all the shoulds and have tos. And, you know, I think we, we talked about a little bit over lunch, like 
so much of the work that I do with people to help them get in touch with wildness is uh, I'm doing this thing. How does it make you feel? It makes me feel terrible. Okay, then, then if it makes you feel terrible, not up here, in your body, you might want to think about not doing that. And the other side of that is what makes you feel good? What, and I mean the, a physical sensation of expansion, of energy moving, of um, the, the, the feeling of like the, the, the feeling that makes you go like this. If you can identify the things that bring that into your body, that feeling of aliveness, awakeness, that is a wild guide. That'll help you go wild and it'll help you live from a different place. Um, so most of us are so stuck in the mental constructions that were presented to us by modern life, all the things we should do and have to do, and that we shut off those instinctual, that part of ourselves that just knows. You know, that part of ourselves that, the part of ourselves that, that when a, a golden retriever runs up to you just loves it, you know? The part of that just can recognize um, these innate places. We shut all of that down so that we can live up to some ideal, so that we can get through it. But to get back in touch with the feeling, that is your internal guidance system. That is your, your instincts that will lead you to a different way of being in the world. So that's become the call for me to, to check in with my body compass. And if my body compass is giving me a, a strong no, you know, we're the only creatures in the world who would walk up to an elevator, see the door open, and a creepy person is standing inside, and get in out of politeness. You know, animals don't do that. If they, if they get a feeling that that's, there's something wrong, they, they trust that feeling. Um, and so work out what you're feeling, the, the sensation in your body that says, yes, this. Work out what that feeling is. Get in touch with the feeling that says, no. Not as a mental construction, but as a body sensation and then just keep turning towards the thing that says yes, that brings you to life. And that's going to give you a look at what your life would be um, if you were willing to really live wildly. And that's, an, that's quite an adventure to go on. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one of my practices, to live in the feeling. It's fantastic. It's yeah. very applicable, so thank you. Um, now, you, uh, in the 40s when apartheid started to become formalized, there were rules that whites couldn't employ blacks or whatnot, yeah. and I believe it was your grandfather who took a stance on that in the bush. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, w we grew up in a country that was severely divided. We, the, you know, the apartheid regime um, tore people apart, and it uh, assigned values to people based on their, um, you know, their, their race, which is... Uh, something that the country continues to try and heal from. But we were lucky because there was something about being out in the wilderness that allowed us as a village of all races to be free of that. Because when you go out into nature, um, when you go out and track a lion together, uh, which is a difficult and dangerous endeavor in, a, in an environment that is, that is hostile to you if you're not aware and if you're not willing to really be there for each other and connect with each other. Um, it, it, the preposterousness of creating divides via race is just, it, it, it's, it's impossible to be with someone in real life situations and maintain some kind of mad structure um, that segregates. And so at Londolozi, we were always lucky to be to have a sh to be involved in a shared endeavour, to be in situations that um, cut us away from those regimes, um, and so we were a very united village uh, always, and and that's why when um, when Mandela came out of prison, um, my f my family worked with a guy called Enos Mabuza, and Enos was an interesting guy. He was he worked for the apartheid government, but he was actually working for the ANC. So he was placed in a position to work out what the apartheid government was trying to do. And at Londolozi, he saw a village that was united um, by the shared endeavor of restoration, of being in nature together. And he had always said to us that this is a place where we're pouring the cultures together, and it's an example of what South Africa should be. And so when Nelson Mandela was released from prison, 
uh, he came, Enos organized for him to come and live with us at Londolozi. And to have his presence there and to have him uh, advocate and say this, he actually he wrote that this was a model uh, that he hoped to see as all people living together in harmony with each other and the natural world. And he hoped that it would be a model that South Africa could build on. Um, so I, I, f I feel like some of the work that I do is too is in this idea of, the, of village building. And village building, uh, one of the core pieces of it is what happens when we're involved in a shared endeavor together. And being out there in the natural world, everywhere you look, there was shared endeavor. And that shared endeavor cuts away all of these, you know, man-made constructs. And, you know, again, I see that part of the expansion of that idea is to start to think of ourselves as humanity together, involved in this endeavor on our planet, um, and to put our energy as, as humanity into developing systems that allow us to live well all together on our planet. Um, and belong to it in a much more profound way. Um, so again, I, I've seen the microcosm, and I feel like to think of ourselves as 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 a grand global collective uh, working together in that way, in harmony with nature and each other. Yeah. So you had um, mentors in the from the Shangan drive who yes. taught you a lot about the bush, um, and you also mentioned there was a a gentleman who was kind of like a, a rebel and he taught you how to track. Can yeah. you talk about your relationships with him and then how you learned to track from him? I was extremely lucky to be exposed to some of the best trackers in the world from a young age. Um, and one of the amazing things about the, the Shangan men who I grew up with is that they had grown up hunting and gathering on the land. And so their, their entire psychology was was so connected with that wilderness. And to be out there with them was to see uh, a place, uh, to see how a wild place talks to you. You know, there's all these signs. The great trackers, they, they know where the animals move. They know the speed at which they're moving. They know where they drink. They know the bird calls. They can tell when a bird is alarming at something. They can, it's like being in, it's like a language. The wilderness has a language, and, and the great trackers speak that language so beautifully. And so I spent as much time as I could with them, and, and they slowly started to teach me that language. And as you learn that language, it's like when you're in a foreign country and you start to pick up the odd word, and then those odd words become sentences, and then as you learn the language, you start to really uh, feel like you're becoming a part of the place. Um, so I was given that opportunity to be with them, and the great trackers are they are examples of living in constant creative response. They're, they never have a plan, and yet they always get onto a track that starts to inform the way they're going to live. They have this, they're all rogues and poets, and you, can't, you can never tell them what to do because they're always very present in the moment. It's like, I will do what the moment, the, this moment is asking of me, what this track, where this track is directing me, what, what the land is saying at this moment is what I'll do. And so I was... Uh, given a different way of thinking about living by being with them. You know, instead of having uh, all of these goals and plans that if you hit them, you might, you might be valuable. You know, you might have done something worthwhile. And rather to find, uh, you know, this, this value is defined by external. They are much more still, and then they feel their curiosity attached to something. They feel an interest. They feel the moment speaking to them, and then that drives their actions. Not out of trying to hit markers, but out of this profound connection with the way the moment is unfolding. And so what I got from them was a different way of thinking about living your life. Uh, one that is guided from the inside as opposed to from the outside. One that it comes out of presence, curiosity, interest in the moment, rather than... Uh, than trying to drive value based on a set of externals. Um, and yeah, so that I, I would say that was the core of, of what being with them was about. Uh, yeah, it's also like it's an, it's an amazing thing to be with people who, uh, who, who just feel so um, cared for by the land they feel like so in touch with it that, and they know that everything they need is there. 
So there's not the scarcity that we live with of like, I've got to get enough. I got to. Um, they live in this very abundant place where it's like they will always get what they need from the land. It'll, it'll be there. Um, in the moment, something will happen and we'll, we'll get it. So it's like the whole psychology is abundant rather than accumulative. You know, it's like, it's like trusting all the time. When you hunt and gather, you always trust that you'll get what you need. Maybe a few days where you're hungry, but you'll keep living, you'll keep surviving. If you know where to look, if you know how to listen, it's there for you. Um, so I think that's a really interesting mindset too. You know that idea that, uh, I can't remember what movie it was in, there's an idea that a truth and a lie in our culture. The truth is, is that if you're out in the cold, uh, in the wilderness, a, a bowl of soup and a blanket will make you more comfortable. The lie is that a thousand bowls of soup and a thousand more blankets will make you a thousand times more comfortable. You know, and that's kind of the core of what I see, this sense of always having enough. And actually, the, we, we touched on it earlier too, the idea that we're obsessed with security you know, in this culture. Like we're obsessed with, with being secure. And in a very strange way, that security robs us, the very thing that we're obsessed with, robs us of the feeling of being alive, the feeling of being engaged. And it's this weird paradox we're living in at the moment. And I mean, I, I work a lot with men uh, who are looking to create the next chapter for themselves. And one of the things that I see is they've, they've incredibly driven to establish security. Um, and then very, very, at, at a certain point, that security starts to become depressing. <laughs> You know, in a very strange way. Why? Because I think that deep inside of us, we're programmed uh, towards certain curiosities. We're programmed to solve problems. We're programmed to be on the track. We're not programmed to find the animal. We're programmed to be on the trail, to be working it out, to be um, trying to find it. We're, and that curiosity nourishes us in a lot of ways. We're, there's like in the core of our nomadic wild being. And if you take that away from us and just say, here, here's a thousand bowls of soup, there's, it, starts to, it starts to shut, shut one down in a very strange way. It's like when you cage a lion, right? Yeah, it's like when you cage a lion. And you know, too, much, too much uncertainty is, is, desta is radically destabilizing, but, but no uncertainty is depressing. So it's a weird paradox that I think we're trying to find our way in. You know, as I was saying, like neuroses is, uh, is a substitute for genuine suffering. And sometimes like in nature, when you, when you are on, on the track of an animal or you've been out there for a few days and you're having to work it out all the time, it's incredibly engaging. And your life feels very full with this thing you're trying to work out. Um, so definitely, uh, there's, a, there's a point of exploration in modern life there for sure. Um, I think the very things that we're, that we're all desperately after uh, are also the things that we're losing ourselves into. Uh, and and well, I'm, I feel like the things we've been told to want are not necessarily turning out to be that fulfilling. And then that becomes a very interesting journey and it goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's like, if you could get out of all the things you should want to be successful, well, what really calls for you, to you? What really, what really fulfills you? What really is meaningful? And how do you start a journey where you begin to track that down, where you begin to find that wild thing out there that would, that would actually um, allow you to rest into your own value? And, and to your own presence. So it's a very interesting thing to go out and, and try and find. Mm -hmm. but, and it begins with actually asking yourself about how you feel, and I mean in a very physical way, it, getting back to that wild sense rather than trying to live into the cultural model. Um, yeah, and to just to watch someone who's truly wild and the freedom of it and the peace of it and the uncertainty of it and and they just rest into it, you know. Excellent. Um, your family had the ability to adopt a lot of animals, and I believe your Uncle John adopted a lion. Can yes. I, can you talk about that experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, w one of the things, my uncle was a documentary filmmaker, and we were raised uh, on the idea that, 
you know, as a documentary filmmaker, what's happen you're, you're an observer. Um, but the more time he spent out of there, he started to have relationships with wild animals. He started to feel himself much more connected to them. And so in some ways that very scientific view of there are the animals and here are the people, it was, it, at some point it has become part of the problem because we think of ourselves as separate. We're really, we're a part of. And so when he started to feel himself much more deeply connected and he started to break out of this idea that we're observers of natures and conquerors of natures and, and start to explore we're a part of nature, he started to get, he, he did a few, he got closer to animals and he, he interfered, not interfered, so to speak, but they, he found an abandoned lion cub and he decided that he would raise it to learn about what it would be like to be in a very close contact with a wild animal like that. And lions are pride animals. And so they, they bond with, if you raise a lion, you become part of its pride. And so that was a, a fascinating um, thing to see that this lioness, as she grew, she, she considered the people who were around her, her pride. And, you know, which was fine when she was this big, but when she got up to 250 pounds and she wanted to come and cuddle with you on the bed, it started to become a little bit more right. challenging. Um, but, you know, when, it, when, like when you get a new kitten and it eats your couch, when you get a lion, like it, it ingests your entire furniture, you know, everything you've got. It'll, um, Wouldn't it bring fresh kills to the house? Oh, right? yeah, bring fresh kills and drag them into the tent. He was living out in a tented camp. Drag them into the tent, feed on them on the bed. Yeah, it, 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 was, uh, it was a wild experiment. And uh, there was one instance where he had gotten malaria. And so that he was living in, in Zambia, in a very wild part of Zambia. They took him and they put him in a boat and they were taking him to the hospital. And this lioness um, ran next to him while he got put in the boat. And then as he crossed the river, she swam next to the boat. And then she wouldn't leave the other side of the bank of the river. She just sat there waiting for him to return. So it was a very deep uh, and beautiful bond. And I think it, again, I mean, I don't necessarily think that everyone should be raising uh, wild lions. But as an experiment, it was a mark of how how closely connected we can become, um, and yeah, it was a it was an amazing experience, experiment and experience. And he also raised two leopard cubs and, and released them back into the wild. Their mother had been killed in a snare, and then he raised them and he released them back into the wild. So that was a that was a success story. Fascinating. Now, your family decided to take the model of conservation at Landalozi and expand it into another organization. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so, uh, so what was established at Lonelozi was, was built on three pillars, care of land, care of wildlife, care of people. And the idea being that if you protected and built a connection with the landscape, thought of the animals of, as your kin, um, that that place would, would start to respond. You would get, people would be able to be with wild animals and people would come and in doing that you would generate this economy of wildlife. So that was the model that was really established at Lonelozi. And... Um, and then in the early 90s, uh, we took that model and we, and we exported it all over Southern Africa. And so we went from being this one operation to being 33 operations around uh, the Southern African continent. And it was taking that idea of restoration and spreading it. And I, it continues to do that work. You know, a few, a few days ago, I had a, we had a guy um, come from the Pantanal in South America. He's got a huge uh, cattle farm in the Pantanal, and that for years they, they've been at war with the jaguar because the jaguar eat the cattle. And he came and he drove around and he saw a pride of lions, he saw a leopard, and I could see the sort of cogs turning. And on about the third day he looked at me and he said, this used to be a cattle ranch. I said, yeah, this used to be a cattle ranch. And he went back to the Pantanal and he put about 50,000 hectares aside as a jaguar sanctuary. Um, and so this is the, the idea of the way that this idea of restoration can start to travel. Once people see it, um, it starts to live inside people as a sort of idea, and then that idea can start to, to spread itself. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, can you talk about uh, your experiences when you're learning how to drive at, what, like seven or eight years old? Yeah. While you're chasing wild game with your uh, uncle? Oh, uh, yes. I mean, I mean, if you grow up in the, 
in the bush, you know, you, it's like growing up on a farm. You get to drive from the time you're really young. People keep putting you into the driver's seat and you keep crashing Land Rovers till eventually you know how to drive them. You peer over the sort of top. Um, but I had one encounter where my uncle, who was this documentary filmmaker, he would make me his driver from the time I was about seven or eight. So we were, we were filming a pack of hyenas that were feeding on a giraffe. And the one hyena pulled off the giraffe's leg and it started running across the savanna. And so I started driving the vehicle because he was on the back filming. I was, we were driving across all this really rough terrain and he screamed uh, left and I turned right by mistake because I was seven years old and you can get your left and right wrong. And he was, he was bracing for the other direction. So he fell off the back, um, camera landed on his head, hyena ran off around the corner, um, he was in a complete rage, chased me around the vehicle for a while while he cooled off. Uh, but that was kind of standard, standard procedure. I mean, we were, we were always stuck in a furrow, stuck in a rainstorm, um, lost, at, lost in the middle of the night. We were always, it, I mean, it was trying to film leopards is a, is a difficult undertaking. And they move off road and you, mostly what happens is you break your Land Rover, you break your camera and you don't see a leopard. <laughs> That seems to be the standard. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your experience with Nelson Mandela? Yeah, sure. Um, so Mandela came on a few. He came on a few separate uh, trips to Londolozi. The first one being straight after he came out of prison, and he was in a period of rest. He was kind of rest and readjustment to his sudden global icon status. If you think he had gone into prison as, a, as an unknown freedom fighter, and he came out of prison as this global icon. And so he was, in a, and he was in a state of sort of adjusting to that, and he needed time to recover and, and get used to being out of prison. And so members of the African National Congress thought that at Londolozi he would have the space away from international press and everyone who wanted to take his picture to sort of have the room to catch his breath again. Um, and it's true that, you know, lions are quite a good deterrent from people who want to come and take pictures of you. So it was good that he was out there. And, and it, was an, it was an amazing time because I was very young at that time. And my mother used to send me to take him breakfast in bed. And I would take him, take his breakfast and put it on a tray. And we would have a little discussion. And I didn't at the time really grasp the gravity of it. And then in, in the sort of late morning, he would go and just in like a sort of a sweat, sweat suit. He would just go and walk around the garden and very quiet, very present. And then I would watch TV at night. And we had this kind of bunny, snowy, snowy TV, you know, always adjusting the, the bunny ears of it, on it at that time. And I would see images on TV of the same quiet man from the garden surrounded by hundreds and thousands of people as the scenes of his release from prison were broadcast all over the world. And it was my first encounter with uh, power through presence. You know, there was, he, he had a way of bringing himself to every encounter uh, where you could feel that he was not trying to establish in himself in some hier hierarchy. He had established something in himself. And that presence would, would always work for him. So, it was, you know, I sort of think as the model that we're given is power through dominance, and he was really the model of power through presence, power, power through connection, and he was amazing. You know, he had a uh, he had a, a manner about him where he would humanize everyone around him, and so even when he met people who had, you know, been the oppressors, um, and he was renowned for this, he would greet them in in their language. He would ask him about specific members of their family. He would reach out to anyone in the moment. He would connect first and then, you know, be sometimes be very hard in establishing the ground rules, but first came this really beautiful connection. Uh, so that was amazing. Uh, I saw, I had, there was one incident where while he was staying with us, my uncle and him used to have breakfast every morning. And my uncle would sit at the head of this table after being out making films and he, and the, the future president would sit on the left and they would sort of, it was very relaxed, they would chat. Uh, and then there was a much more official sort of gathering which was happening at the camp and 
a whole lot of people from the ANC had come in, members of the party, and they were going to have a very serious discussion. And my uncle was going to the discussion. And as he walked up to the table, in an extremely rare moment of tact for him, he realized, oh, no, I'd better put the future president at the head of the table. So he said, please, Mr. Mandela, you must sit at the head of the table. You know? And uh, Mandela just grabbed him by the hand. He was very tactile. He grabbed him by the hand and said, oh, no, I would never take your place at the head of the table. And he just, uh, he just would downgrade the moment and always lead, but in this very uh, relaxed way. You know, he, and, and he was, between them, he was maintaining uh, part of their ritual. And he was not going to throw the way they had been doing it out of the window to make an appearance for everyone else at the table. And he was, no, you sit there, I'll sit here. I'm still, I'm still in charge, you know, but in a really humanizing and wonderful way. It's amazing to see such a great person like that, but then see he's even better behind. Ah, like, yeah, I mean, just astounding. I mean, everyone in South Africa, we called it Mandela magic, you know, everyone in South Africa had a personal, a story of a personal encounter with him. It was, I mean, everywhere you went, people would say, you know, it was like he was everywhere. He went to sports events, we won, um, and there was this very strong feeling that, that, that he raised the entire outlook and narrative of the country. You know, if you think of that idea of uh, entrainment, you know, have you heard this idea that if you're around, everyone's brains has mirror neurons. And as we interact with people, our mirror neurons start tapping into their mirror neurons. We start becoming like them in a very specific way. And the more present you are, the more almost uh, you can shape other people's mirror neurons around you. And it's a kind of like entrainment. And people sort of talk about it. I don't know whether it's true or not. But I was very interested when I heard it because there was this overwhelming feeling that Mandela sort of entrained the entire country to a better version of itself, to a higher consciousness, to a, a stronger outlook. And um, I, don't, I feel like uh, we're in desperate need of more leaders like that who can model that kind of heart and presence uh, and show us a different way of being. Right, and that ties into Ubuntu. Can you talk about what that word is? Yeah, I mean, Ubuntu is, he was the model of Ubuntu. He was the embodiment of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is an African value that says, I am because of you. And we experience the deepest parts of ourselves through our interactions with other people. And so one of the ways they say it is, people are not people without other people. Um, and and in a more collective society, and if you grow up in the villages in Africa, it, it is more collective. There is no, the, you don't, I think of it as a we consciousness rather than an I consciousness. Everything is, is about the well-being of the we rather than this hyper-individuality that we see in other parts of the world. Uh, and so Ubuntu is that. It is, I can't be a person uh, sorry, I'm smacking the microphone. I, I can't be a person without you being a person. And, and we make each other human. We make each other... Uh, we, we can only bring our humanity out in relation. Um, and it's an idea that just becomes more and more important in these times as we see more and more uh, of this kind of egoic obsession with self, with uh, self and group, you know, and it, it seems like we just are forgetting how to humanize each other in every moment. And so, so to find your own humanity, to find, to be kind to yourself, to find that part of yourself that discovers it, itself in, in something else. The last question I have, um, going back to Mandela, um, in Ubuntu, there was, I guess, a riot going on and that Mandela was seeing on the TV. Yeah. And your dad had this quote that encapsulated that. Can you, can you talk a little about that? Um, yeah, there was, there was uh, just after independence, um, there was a thing called the Cadessa Talks. And the Cadessa Talks were talks about how they would have talks. So talks about how the, uh, the nationalist apartheid government and the ANC would set up a framework by which they could 
uh, create the handover of power in the country. And Mandela was staying with us. And in the midst of these talks, the right wing of South, Af of South Africa drove an armored car into the conference room where the talks were going on. And there was a huge um, uproar. It was like the country was on the brink of war. And Mandela came out and he, and he, and he said, he was very agitated, and he said to my father and uncle, you will get me a helicopter right now. I need to fly to be with my people. And my father said to him, uh, no. And he said, you will get me a helicopter. I need to be with my people. And my father said, I am your people. And if you go there, some fool might take a shot at you. And I'm, I won't do that. I won't allow that. So we'll get you a, an airplane and we'll fly you nearby and then your security can assess whether you can go there. And he just stopped for a moment and he went, that's a better idea, let's do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's just, uh, you know, one of those, like, one of those historical moments. Um, and, and really like the force of the man and the ability to quickly change course, you know. Right. That's, that's a better idea, let's do that. Yeah, that's awesome. no, no, no need to assert anything beyond that. What's best? Yeah, that's excellent. Um, Is that the story you were thinking? Yes, of? that was exactly what uh, it yeah. was. Um, that your dad can put another notch in his belt. I, yeah. I argued Nelson Mandela. <laughs> yeah, screamed, uh, told <laughs> Nelson Mandela no. <laughs> Probably one of the yeah. few people. Do we have any audience questions? Um, if not, I'm going to go off for online questions. Can you talk about your writing process for the book? Did you outline plan extensively? How long did it take you to write the book? Um, and what was just your regular practice getting this going? The book started just out of um, telling campfire stories. And then I, I met some people who said, well, you know, you should write those campfire stories down. Because, I mean, I, was, I, wrote, I wrote a memoir in my 20s, which is kind of funny in its own right. Um, but there were a lot of amazing encounters along the way. And so first I just started capturing stories and it and then starting to sort of work out how they fitted together. And it was, it was very organic. I just, when something happened out there or I had a memory of something happened, I just started to put it together. And, and I just wrote, one of the great things about it was at that time, I just wrote out of the sheer uh, joy of capturing the stories. You know, it was like right at the time when publishing was dying and everyone was like, no one's publishing anything. And, and I was just like, well, these, these are my stories. And so I wrote them all down. And what I discovered in that is like stories are a kind of medicine, you know. And we're, as humans, we're, we're narrative creatures. We belong to certain stories. And so part of like learning to tell your own story is like learning to belong to your own life in a, in a really unusual way. And I think it's, it's another reason why we need to tell the story of restoration so that as a society it can become something we start to belong to. So I just wrote for the joy of it and compiled it. And out of writing to that joy, I was lucky enough to meet um, an editor and, and someone who actually knew how to take all those stories and, and put it together. Um, but it was, the book for me was one of those moments, like I didn't consider myself a writer where I just... I felt compelled towards something and I just followed it into a time when there would be no financial reward for it, no one was publishing books, it would probably never go anywhere and I didn't care because I was enjoying doing it so much and I, that I think is an interesting track sometimes in life. And then of course I had this really crazy experience where it did get published, um, someone did pay for it, it was all these things that everyone told me were impossible came but they were not my focus. And so the, the, the learning of that book for me was just to live on the feeling with, with no idea of what the outcome can be. Because you can't know, and so many of the people I work with now um, will say to me, when I know what the next thing is, then I'll make some changes. And I'm like, it doesn't always work like that. You know, sometimes you've got to, you've got to be willing to not know and just step out into the unknown on, on little clues, on little feelings. And sometimes an, an outcome, an unexpected outcome, like a book, can come out of just enjoying writing your campfire stories. Right. You know. Can you talk about the challenges and triumphs you face when trying to protect the animals within and beyond the wildlife preserves? Uh, yeah, it's, it's ongoing. Um, 
The challenges are that um, that we're losing we're losing more and more. Uh, I feel like as we're losing more and more our own ability to be natural as people, the natural world is receding away from us, and there's this weird thing where. Um, even even the other day, I drove down the west coast and I drove through all the fires from Oregon down into California, and that was right at the same time that the storm was hitting Florida, and I kept finding myself saying like, "Man, this is what the future is going to be like all the time." You know, heat waves, fires, hurricanes. This is what the future is going to be like, and it's this weird collective denial. You know, even in the language, because I was like, "This is not what the future is going to be like. This is what now is like." And one of the, the biggest challenges is how do we get out of this collective denial that it is, it is upon us. We are in a, a great ecological collapse. And so, so how do we find our way to something positive within that? How do, we, how do we start to gather up in community as this change starts to happen and find our way into something more connected more loving, more compassionate to ourselves, to the earth, to community. And I think I'm getting a little bit away from the question, but continue. <laughs> th that, is, that is the big challenge, is how do we love what's dying right now? And some of that goes all the way back to ourselves and realizing that, you know, life is... Um, I, used to, I used to be a radical conservationist, you know, and I still believe in that. But I really feel now like the shift has to come in human consciousness. And one of the things that we refuse in our society is we refuse to believe that we are going to die. We hide our old people away. Um, we, we just we refuse to accept that that is coming for us. And a society that is afraid of dying is afraid of living and afraid of exploring what it would actually mean to live in a really connected way. And so some of the ecological issues we face are born out of something inside of us. Um, and I feel like we have to build a relationship with that place, all of us, collectively, and find our way into living a life that, that reflects abundance and enough within ourselves. And, and that is going to create the change in the environment. Um, that is going to change our relationship with the natural world. And until then, um, we've just got to love every moment that we can, that we, that we get to have with a wild place. Because I don't know what it's going to look like in, in 20 years from now. You know? um, and to not be crushed by that, you know? to not be overwhelmed by, by that feeling. I don't think I got anywhere near that question, but that's what came out. <laughs> got it. Well, thank you so much for... Uh First of all, writing this book and sharing with us your experience and then coming down to here to Google yeah. to answer our questions here and join us. So we're going to give you a round of applause. and uh, tell you thank, thank you so much. Great to be with you. Thanks.